Hello, and welcome to the third episode of Breaking Monero. Breaking Monero is a series of episodes where we explain the limitations of Monero's security and privacy in a comprehensive and understandable way. Today, we are talking about zero decoy transactions or zero mix in transactions and the uh, chain reaction effect that sort of comes as a result of these. So sort of a double episode today, but we're gonna try and keep it shorter than the other two in order to get a little bit more streamlined and specific here. So as always, I'm Justin. We also have Sarang on here. If you wanted to say hi real quick, Sarang. Hello, um, I go by Sarang Nother and I'm one of the uh, researchers who does work on behalf of Monero Research Lab and Monero Community. Excellent, so I actually wanna start off with a, a nice quick uh, screen share from one of the presentations I gave at DEF CON where I talked about these ring signatures specifically. So let me just pull that up. Okay, so you can see here on the left of the screen, there is a ring signature, everything in this green oval here. That's like all of the potential outputs that can be sent in a Monero transaction. Let's say that this gold one, uh, this gold one here that I have my cursor on is one that is the true one spent and therefore has the key image that comes from it. And all these black pots of gold that are just Monero outputs are potential spends. For zero decoy transactions, these are transactions that are sent without any other output being a possible spend. So if you see this transaction, you know that that is the actual output that is spent. So you can see an example here. Suppose this is another zero uh, decoy transaction. It's a ring size of one. You know, since only one output is possibly included in this ring, that that is truly the output that is spent there. So as a result, you can say, okay, since this is spent here, I can look at all other transactions that include this output and say, hey, this output cannot be there. As the example here, the ring size includes this output. So you can put a nice X through this output to say, hey, obviously that output could not truly have been spent. And then if we continue this along for several other transactions where they each have their own set of zero decoys. Um, the, again, these are old Monero transactions uh, that could be sent in, in Monero's early history in 2014 and 2015. Um, and you can see that if every single other output is referenced in a different zero decoy transaction, then you can realize that one of the outputs is actually spent if there's only one plausible spend left. And therefore, that ring signature is compromised. This is really the basics of a whole zero decoy attack or a zero decoy form of analysis where you look at transactions where there is only one possible actual output spend and you compare it to other transactions to learn information to sort of sort of whittle down and narrow down information. And then from there, since this output is known to be spent in this one transaction, the, the yellow one there, then any other transactions that could include that output, for example, uh, t this output, uh, and created in TX10, then we can also eliminate it here as shown in the second ring signature that's that's on the right here, um, where you sort of have this propagating effect. This propagating effect is called the chain reaction. So on a really high level, this diagram I think really helps summarize the idea of zero decoy attacks and analysis on Monero and the sort of resounding chain of reaction that results from these zero decoy transactions. Uh, does that look good to you, Sarang? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the way that I kind of visualize this iterative process in my head is almost kind of like peeling away an onion. I mean, it's not an exact analogy because these aren't things aren't onions. But generally, the idea is that you, like you said, you look at zero decoy uh, transactions, you look for their appearance elsewhere, and you can just start peeling those off of other rings. And eventually, you might get some rings that then become zero decoy transactions, and then you can take those and iteratively work those through larger rings. So you're right, basically the whole idea is to iteratively find zero decoy transactions using the property that zero decoy transactions have outputs that are known to be spent. And of course in Monero, the whole goal is that we don't want to know if an output is being spent or not because that makes it an invalid decoy for a future larger ring. So Monero moved to make zero, uh, zero decoy transactions disallowed beginning, I believe in March, 2016, is that correct? Possibly, okay. I feel like I should have looked that up before. Yep. <laughs> so 
but between that period of time when Monero raised uh, the minimum ring size and until the onset of Ring CT in early 2017, you still saw the zero decoy uh, analysis still have some, although decreasing, it still had some measurable impact. You could still learn a lot about transactions. Why was that really the case that you could still perform this analysis despite no one being able to send these transactions anymore? Sure. So again, the whole idea of this is that it is iterative, right? So um, when you're able to take early transactions and uh, you know kind of whittle away what the known decoys are to get to the true spends, you can kind of push those forward into smaller rings and then in a little bit into larger. So as ring size gets, gets bigger, um, effectively the number of outputs that you're able to kind of whittle away from those larger rings you know, ends up being less effective. So again, part of the reason we have the larger ring size and ring size increases over time um, is so such analysis is less effective. It's kind of a belt and suspenders approach. You're kind of adding in some more decoys to ensure that that propagating effect has less of an effect. So they still were, you know, effective to a degree, but the degree to which they were effective definitely went down over time. Um, part of the reason that that is, is because the way that you choose your decoys, um, we haven't really talked about exactly how we do that. We just kind of use the word random kind of don't talk about it, has changed over time. And I know that we're gonna be having a future episode about how exactly we choose outputs from the chain and why that does matter when it comes to decoys. Um, but suffice it to say that the way that we started choosing um, our outputs has gotten better over time. And that has also made this particular analysis less effective than it was before. Excellent, thanks. So um, can you speak a little bit about the history where Monero was learning about these sort of zero decoys? I know that there was the research papers, MRL1, MRL4, that talked about the idea, especially in regards to, to chain reactions. Or th those are specifically addressed in those research papers. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and, and you said that there was a new research paper, or relatively new research paper at least, that helps quantify these a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. So um, the idea of this was known for quite some time. There was some internal discussion that eventually culminated in a couple of internal papers, MRL 1 and 4, that talk about this to varying degrees, um, some of which was in the form of kind of an accidental passive analysis, and some of which was from kind of an active analysis perspective, where, you know, you might have someone who's purposely, you know, injecting outputs into the chain that they then have some knowledge over. So you can look at it a few different ways. Um, but the extent to which this actually happened on the later chain wasn't really quantified until a couple of papers came out, um, one of which was had two different names. I think it, uh, its its name as an early preprint was a little bit different. But the later preprint from April 2017 was called an empirical analysis of traceability in the Monero blockchain. And then there was another later paper, um, which has a confusingly similar name, a traceability analysis of Monero's blockchain, um, that, that did a really good job of talking about a few different forms of analysis and did a good job starting to kind of quantify those forms of analysis. I mean, what they showed and kind of the number that got floated around for a while was that something like that something like 65% of Monero outputs were known to be traceable by some combination of zero mix in chain reaction, maybe a couple other forms of analysis, which on its face sounds very, very scary. You're like my goodness, if 65% of the outputs are known to be spent and should not be chosen as decoys for modern transactions, surely I and everyone else are totally screwed. Um, but again, the way that we choose our outputs is very, very unlikely and is less likely over time to choose any of these. Um, and then later on, um, a lot of other papers um, seem to kind of rediscover this analysis. So, you know, we saw kind of a swath of preprints over time um, that maybe introduced one or two other newer small forms of analysis, but also for some reason tended to bring up this, this idea of chain reaction over and over again as part of that analysis, um, which I, I think led to kind of some, some misunderstanding about, you know, what was already known about chain reaction, unfortunately. Um, so we actually did kind of a, a fairly independent look to see if we could reproduce those values in MRL0007, um, where we introduced another more general form of analysis. And we found approximately the same numbers, um, that if you just kind of look at the chain as a whole, um, from you know, whatever point they looked at it, you know, kind of back toward the beginning of Monero's history, you still saw around 65% you know, of outputs being known to be spent based on this analysis. But if you look at modern transactions, in particular, kind of after the big ring CT switch, you know, they're vanishing. I mean, at the time that we did it, you know, we found that precisely zero outputs were vulnerable to this kind of analysis. And again, if you were to choose old outputs that were known to be compromised, that would be bad. But modern transactions do not do this. Exactly. I think that's important to sort of cover. In the last episode, we talked about the idea of plausible deniability. Zero decoy transactions were a really important 
sort of uh, area to look at because it broke down the plausible deniability of people's transactions on Monero because you could explicitly look just at the information on Monero's blockchain and determine that since this sort of transaction occurred, this output could not have possibly have been spent anywhere else. So it was a really important consideration to look at. And it was really great to see. I know we have several responses out there. We have several research papers at this point that looks into this, but it's important to distinguish Monero pre-Ring CT and Monero with Ring CT because it's night and day difference. And it is, it is, you know, yeah. and it's definitely worth noting that, you know, that trans modern transactions that only use Ring CT outputs. And for the most part, that's, you know, van like with vanishingly small exception, that is the transaction. Those are the transactions that happen. You know, early pre-ring CT outputs. Remember, those are the ones where we had denominations, kind of like bills and stuff. You know, those aren't chosen or used. So a lot of the papers did not make a, cl a clear enough distinction. And I think that that kind of muddied the waters for a while on, you know, this whole 65% number. So is there anything else, Rang, you wanted to mention on zero decoys, zero mix in transactions? Or do you want to focus now a little bit more on the idea of chain reactions, which are continue to be something we sort of test other attack vectors with in Monero uh, with these these sort of change of reaction uh, methods because we don't really look at zero decor or zoom mix and really anymore because Monero sort of moved on from those. No, that's true. And and I mean, to be fair, you know, the idea of zero mixing is what underlies the idea of a chain reaction because you got kind of this onion methodology for trying to piece transactions apart. Um, but as we're going to talk about in later episodes, we have other methods of analysis to try to determine whether or not outputs are spent. And you can apply the idea of a chain reaction after you run those other analyses. So if I'm able to determine by some other means, you know, whether or not another set of outputs is spent through my new clever analysis, whatever it might be, and there's been, in, you know, improvements to this over time, you know, you can also take those outputs, which you now know are spent. Those are effectively a zero mix in transaction, and you can then apply chain reaction off of those. So in general, while we do find that being able to identify some modern outputs is spent, does let you kind of remove them from consideration from other modern transactions. Again, the entire point of a chain reaction is that you have to be able to do that enough so that you get another large ring all the way down to one remaining output. And in general, we're not able to do that, which is good. You know, maybe in some transactions you can remove one, two, maybe even, you know, a higher number than that from consideration. But provided you don't get down to one, you still have that plausible deniability. Excellent. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really important to cover the idea of zero decoy, zero mix in because it you it you can sort of reuse the same sort of thinking that you do for these zero decoy, zero mix in, which are pretty basic and really easy to understand for far more complicated attacks that sort of try and recreate a sort of zero mix in, zero decoy situation. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, it's important to show people. I have uh, a spreadsheet that I'm going to show with you all, uh, share with you all, regarding how we sort of evaluate this chain reaction and see under what uh, network circumstances with a variety of uh, compromised outputs that other transactions are also compromised. So I'm just gonna start sharing that. Um, let me get that up here. All right, so I use this pretty frequently. Um, I, I created this in early 2018 to help better under, to, to make a spreadsheet that's easier for people to understand. This is really just though, an extension of MRL one and four. It, there aren't any real new ideas introduced here. It's just really easy to play around with. So I have just for like a really easy sake here, I have the ring size set to three right here. So it's 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 a really low ring size, but this was Monero's first mandatory minimum ring size here was, was three. And you can see here that for on the left here, you have a different proportion of outputs that are compromised. So these vary between zero and I mean, technically not 100%, but essentially 100% there. And you can see the proportion of the time that the true input is revealed um, based off of uh, you being able to break down these ring signatures. So you can sort of look and see directly at the chain reaction effect here. So you sort of say, okay, half of the outputs are compromised, let's say. If let's say half the outputs are zero decoy, you can go through and say, okay, well then, for 25% of the transactions out of the box by just doing this one level of analysis, you can say, okay, well, these are now compromised. And then you can say, okay, well, now we found these 25% new compromised outputs. Let's run the test again, including these 25% as compromised. And you can do this across several layers here. 
until you ultimately take the sum of all these amounts in this last column here. This is the total proportion of all the outputs that are compromised, that um, are compromised after this sort of chain reaction impact. So if you have a circumstance where 50% of the outputs are revealed to be true uh, under a certain circumstance, you can keep running tests and sort of break down the integrity of uh, you know, another 29% of the outputs. So the total amount would be about 80% uh, of the total outputs would be known uh, to an outside attacker. So I sort of, these numbers don't really mean anything, but a larger number means a, a larger chain reaction. <laughs> in, in the sense, I sort of just add them together. Um, so you can see if I put in a smaller ring size, let's put um, Monero's current ring size in here of 11, that these chain reactions get very, very small, right? You're down to a much smaller number than you were before. Uh, as far as like relative terms, this is 0 0.01. Before it was 1.24. Um, and again, that number doesn't really mean anything. It's just sort of a number you can compare to other ring sizes. So, but ultimately you can see for any specific amount, the first order effect is, is vanishingly small, even for enormous amounts of compromised outputs for large ring sizes. And if we went to an incredible ring size, like 100 or whatever, you can see like <laughs> the chain reaction would have to be quite immense for it to really have any substantial impact on other transactions. So I'm just going to quickly just show the sort of difference between Monero with ring size 3 and Monero with ring size 11, what it has now on the chart here on the right. And you can see on the bottom right here, this is the proportion of sort of known compromised outputs to begin with. And on the y-axis here, you can see the proportion of transactions that were compromised or a proportion of rings that are compromised. And so you can see here with ring size 3, there's far less protection than ring size 11. And as the ring size gets larger and larger, these curves shift, shift further and further to the right and get like uh, increasingly steep curves because it takes more in order to perform a chain reaction effect. So this is what Sarang and I mean when we say that transactions need to, uh, or with large ring sizes, it really starts to take a lot in order to have chain reactions on the Monero network. So I find this resource to be really easy to sort of help quantify what we mean with chain reactions. We'll often run this table. Again, this doesn't have to be for zero decoys that are affected, but it could be any sort of proportion of outputs that are affected. And we can run tests regarding uh, uh, the information that we plug into this Excel spreadsheet that I, I generally find very valuable. Nice. Yeah, um, and it's also worth noting too that um, you know again, while modern transactions are you know vastly unaffected by any of this particular kind of analysis, um, we do in fact have a tool that it is available as part of the Monero kind of general built-in tool tool set. Um, we used to call it the black ball tool. We realized that it was kind of a confusing name. Um, I might consider it just a spent output tool. And what it lets you do is it lets you take your copy of the blockchain. It lets you run all sorts of analyses, including this one, zero decoy and chain reaction and internally kind of flag those outputs that again are known to be spent and should not be chosen as decoys. And it will make absolutely certain that you do not choose those as decoys. Again, the, uh, the likelihood in a modern transaction of choosing you know, an output that has been affected by this analysis is vanishingly small, vanishingly, vanishingly small. As in we haven't come up with any modern outputs that haven't happened yet. Um, but for transactions that do spend you know, older, um, like a lot, a lot of older pre-ring CT outputs, it will still help you avoid those. The tool is kind of inefficient to run because it does a lot of analysis, you know, but if you take a belt and suspenders and glue the pants on yourself approach, you know, a tool is available uh, to help you do that. It's generally my opinion that with, with large ring sizes, this tool really helps us only evaluate whether or not the network is under a sort of severe attack, where if you have a chain split, you can be like, okay, let me go evaluate at this point. We'll talk about chain splits later. It's not necessarily a tool that people need to run for the sake of sending funds for a low risk transaction or even no, absolutely not. I mean, in, you know, for, for zero decoy transactions um, and for chain reaction based transactions, again, modern transactions are unaffected. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So I think we really covered most of the basics on zero decoy and chain reaction. I, hopefully this is a nice summary for people. Is there anything else you want to add to this conversation, Sarang? 
Um, just that, you know, there was a lot of really good research that originally went into this, um, both internally and by external researchers. And I mean, there still continues to be research on this topic, even though we understand it pretty well um, by researchers who may not have read the previous papers um, or were adding things on to them. Um, so there are plenty of different papers and preprints available if you have kind of a more scientific or mathematical bent to you and want to learn more about kind of the analysis that led to um, our protections against these kind of analysis. Excellent. So uh, again, thank you for thank you, Sarang, for joining me. Thank you to the listeners for for watching this latest episode of Breaking Monero. I'm glad this one is, is shorter. So hopefully, it was nice and just all the information you need and not much else. So we'll keep trying to make other episodes short for you all. Um, with that, we would like to say goodbye. Make sure to watch our later episodes and take care. See ya.